folks, I'll just introduce myself quick. I'm Shannon Jamison. Uh, my family and I farm about, we have about 2,800 acres. We farm 2,000 acres in row crops, soybean and corn, traditional uh, rotation, pretty much all south of Des Moines. So um, starting maybe as far north as Martinsdale and as far south as Osceola, we have basically chunks of, chunks of ground all the way down there. We do have one central farm where we have our, uh, call it our like little mini co-op, where we store all our grain and everything and then also have it set up uh, for a cattle operation there. We currently don't have any livestock right now, mostly based on manpower issues. So we used to have a hired hand that was with us full time. The other members of my family and I all have jobs off the farms. So right now without having him, we don't really have the ability to like manage having beef cattle. So we've had as many as 80, uh, an 80 head of like cow calf herd uh, and down to as few as 15. And right now this spring, we sold everything off and we don't have any livestock uh, at this time. Uh, this year is our first year doing any kind of cover cropping. So um, I can talk to that a little bit more when we get, get going, but basically um, trying to utilize the subsidies to get going in it, convince my older father that it's a good idea to do it uh, and some of those other things. So uh, that's sort of our my side and our farm's background. Okay. I'm. Alan Zomer, I'm from Atlantic, Iowa. Um, we run uh, a couple thousand acres of row crop. Um, we'll run upwards of 1,800 cows, and then we run a feedlot. Um, and we're in a specialty business where we feed the Wagyu's, which are the ones that actually make the Kobe meat. Um, started out farming um, because my dad didn't want me to. <laughs> and um, the worst thing to do to a little German boy is telling him you can't farm. Um, so my wife and I started really early. We have six kids. Uh, now we have 19 grandkids. And probably the biggest goal at first was just to keep everybody fed. And then um, really enjoyed what I was doing when I worked for other farmers, so I decided I wanted to do it for myself. So it kind of took off from there. Now we've got 19 grandkids. and. The big goal in our picture is, is any one of those kids that wants to be involved in our operation, I'd like to have an operation that has enough size that can accommodate family members. So we currently have two sons that are in the business with us, a whole host of grandkids on any day. I'm back to driving four-door pickups because I have so many grandkids that go with me from time to time that the two doors won't work with the car seats. So um, we... Uh, have a full blood Wagyu herd. Um, we raise breeding stock, and then we have a lot of our cows are out on custom to have people that take care of them. Um, currently, the majority of them are in Missouri because as the grain prices continue to increase, the land goes away from pasture land. Um, so anybody that's looking to run some cows, um, I'd sure like to visit with them about it. So that's my commercial for the day, but... Um, I don't know where to start here. Um, okay, well, we'll just, I'm just gonna start asking you questions. So when we first started talking on the phone, we met our, on the phone for maybe, I don't know, 10 minutes, about right. a week ago, and he said, hey, how's your cover crop doing? And I said, I, I have no idea. Uh, mostly because I don't know what I'm looking at. So what we did this year is we uh, had it uh, flown on. So uh, I'm a pilot by trade. I'm in the Air National Guard and also a pilot at the airlines. I have some buddies that have a aerial spray company and so I, that's who I went through to get our cover cropping stuff done. Uh, it was Stott Aerospray. Basically flew on our, our cereal rye, which is what we did the first year uh, because basically it's our first year. So everyone's advice was like, don't get too crazy. I wanted to do some radishes and some other stuff just because I thought that sounded cool. But everyone's like, don't, don't do any of that. Just do cereal rye. So that's what we did. Um, we had that flown on the first week of September, both into some ground that was soybeans and into some ground that was standing corn. Okay. Um, so uh, basically he goes, well, how's it look? I go, he goes, you have a good stand? I was like, I have no idea. So if you want to tell a little bit about like how you know okay, if so it's a good stand and then really is there anything you could do about it? So I'm sort of in the place where, all right, we, we flew it on. I think it looks good. There's some green stuff out there, right? But I haven't, I mean, at this point now I'm just waiting for spring. Okay, so I'll, I'll, I'll back up. I've, I've been doing cover crops before cover crops were cool because I would chop and then I would come back in and I'd drill alfalfa back in. And so there was a regular rotation that we had going and usually we would chop 15 or 20 acres. At that time, I maybe had 80, 90 cows and I had a feedlot. I started out farrow to finish is where I started. And when the integration took 
place in the hug business, um, the last thing that I do is ever let anybody hook the rope in and lead me. I'm just not one of those guys. I could see that the hog industry was going the direction I didn't want to. So I sold 300 sows and bought 200 cows, and all of a sudden I had to have a feedlot. So then I had to start chopping, um, drilling the alfalfa in, um, and then the, in, the ethanol industry started to take off and open up, and the byproducts that come out of the ethanol plants um, basically in our operation, we overfeed protein right now, so I didn't need the alfalfa anymore. So we were looking around for something different, and we, we do cut a lot of grass hay on, on some farms that are gonna stay in grass, um, not available to be grazed. And everybody was talking about cereal rye, so I, I tune into it, and usually I'm, I'm one of those guys that's a little bit over the edge, that's what I do is I, I go see if we can figure it out. So we tried um, flying a lot of our acres on. Uh, very, very inconsistent. Um, we, we couldn't count on anything. So uh, seven years ago, I went looking for a no-till drill that we all used to drill beans with to put the rye in and ended up going clear to Kansas to find a drill that was of what I considered affordable to try this experiment with. And so fast forward to now, everything that we're gonna harvest or chop, I consider it a third crop in our operation. Everything that we're gonna chop, graze, I drill, because I know I have good seed to soil contact and I'll have a good crop, per, you know, g given rain and moisture and stuff. Everything that I know I can't get over, we're 100% cover crop, I fly on. Um, very inconsistent. Um, it doesn't matter to me, yes, it does, but if I can't cover the acres, labor is a problem to have enough help. Retired people are fantastic for a drill. You just fill the seed tender, it's there waiting for them, this is the farm you want, here's the drill, make sure it has markers. Most of them don't like any of the, the guidance part and let them go to work. And, and in our operation, it's a race. I'm chasing the combine out of the field with a drill to put rye in, and we, we will chop uh, 400 to 700 acres a year. We use a, a windrower with a merger that, that puts it all in a windrow because the most expensive thing that I have running out there is the chopper. So you want him busy, and I, and I hire it, the chopping done. We do all the hauling ourselves. But then I'm chasing him out of the field with a split row bean planter to put beans back in, right behind it. So I, I probably went way past your question. No, this is good. But this, this is where we've, came, we've come from to where we are now. Um, I went to a meeting and they said, let the shucks on the corn turn brown and then put it in the air and put your, your eye in. I, can, I could take you to farms today and show you on the backsides of terraces which way the plane was going. So, the, so I think the thing we miss, Ariel, is that seed to soil contact to confirm it that we're gonna have a good crop. Right, so what we struggle with, or I mean obviously right now we haven't gone as far as you have to go find a way to put it in the ground ourselves. Right. Right. And then, as I mentioned earlier, manpower being the issue for us. So with the 2,000 acres that we have and the manpower that we have, we're on our last 100 acres of corn right now. So my uncle's out in the field as we speak, driving, I probably should be there right now, but uh, getting the last of the corn out of the field. So flying it on for us was the only option right. for manpower purposes. I think we probably have the tractors to get it done and probably could could chase around the, the combine just like you suggested. It's just a matter of having someone to operate it between operating yep. the, we operate our own semis, so we don't hire that out. Uh, in our own, obviously, grain cart and combine, and then we store it all in our own, you know, little grain bin operation. So for us, that was why we basically went right into aerial. Now, we probably could hire somebody to come drill it in. Right. Um, but I'd have to see on the cost side mm -hmm. of what of what that would cost as far as, as far as that's concerned. But I could see what you were saying in our land for where, because we had it flown onto a, one really flat field, and, but that was, that was in corn. And so you could see that it didn't do quite as well with the corn standing as far as like it gaining traction right away, but after we went and picked it, it seemed to do quite a bit better. Right. Uh, get a little bit more sun. 
And then the other field that we had it flown onto was fairly hilly. So we had about 250 acres of cover crop this year, 70 or 80 acres of it was super flat. And the whole remainder of it was what I would consider a Southern Iowa standard, if you will. The farm ground's not really flat down there. Right, right. So, um, and you could see there where on all of the like hilltops and everything else, it's got a really pretty good stand like you were talking about where you could, you know, kind of like a yard. And, uh, and the side hills definitely were not nearly as populated as, as what was on the top for, for right. flying it on. So the, so the cover crop to me, when, when I'm gonna harvest it or graze it, um, we do about 100 pounds to the acre. Um, if I'm putting the cover crop on with an airplane, I'll pull that back to basically a bushel to the acre or 60 pounds. That's what we did. Okay, and then if I'm gonna harvest it or graze it, I'll put nitrogen and sulfur on early spring um, to, to boost the tonnage is what I'm after. Cool. Give me another question. Another question. Otherwise, I'm just going to babble. No, I don't think you're babbling at all. I think so far what you're saying is awesome. Um, let's see. So as you go into it in the spring, how long do you wait before you actually put any livestock on it? in the spring. So you said you have both a feedlot for feeding everything out, but then your herds, you graze them on it. Right. So when do you actually say, okay, now it's like, it's at the point where it's gonna be helpful and healthy and now I can turn them out. And then how much, how much of it do you put in rotation at a time? Like per, I guess per cow head or, I mean, do you break up your fields so that they yeah. can, do you follow okay. what I'm asking? Okay, so my experience with grazing on it, um, first year in that we went to graze, I wouldn't allow, I have two sons, the younger son is the, is the cow guy and the, or the, the livestock guy. I need one of those. In Somebody my has one of those. They want to you send can't have him because he's priceless. <laughs> so I hope this is not on anywhere where he sees it or he'll, he'll want his wages raised. But um, he, uh, we, we let that, in fact, that's what this picture, oh, oh she, she already she, changed it. She switched it. over to mine. That's fine. So that, that farm right there is a 50, low 50 CSR farm. There's an e-slope on it. Uh, it's a 300 acre farm. It was rotationally grazed for years. Um, and then $8 corn showed up. So I took 150 acres of it away from the younger son and said, we're gonna put this to crop because the economics said we needed to. He wants to put it back to grass, so we've for the last, I believe it's been eight years now, we have raised soybeans and rye on it. That's all we've done, and, and cow-calf pears. So we, the very first year, to, to get back to your question, I made him wait until the rye got to be boot high. That's we, a scientific measurement, folks, boot high. Yep, yep. We turned 150 cows out, and they were in, either they were pears or they were individual getting ready to calve. And the message I got back was, don't you ever do that again, or we're not doing this again, because he said, I can see the cow, but I can't find the calf. <laughs> so he said, here, she doesn't want me around her, now I'm running around in waist-high grass trying to get this done. So that was mistake number one. Um, so then we went to six to eight inches tall, and we turned the cows out. We broke it back up into paddocks so we could graze it. Four paddocks on 150 acres. We ran a water line out into the middle just on top of the ground and set up a tank so the cows could drink. And currently what we've been doing with this farm since then is we run about 300 pairs out there on 150 acres and the rye will keep up. Two years ago, we came to the conclusion that we were gonna leave it in rye and see how long we could graze it graze it all year was the plan. So we ran the cows. Uh, we actually went out with a bush hog and mowed it, a bat wing mower, and mowed off the heads because if it goes to head, it's done. Um, it went back into the vegetative state and started growing. It looked excellent. We got really dry and the message I got was it's done. Um, we're going to have to move the cows off of it because we have smaller pastures that we take these cows and we'll spread them out on it as, as they calve. They're all individually tagged, paired up, and then, and then they're moved off to different pastures. So we decided that we needed to get the cows off of it. Well, over the weekend, we caught a rain. And we, when we went over, back over to get those cows off that ryegrass, it was like, this is unbelievable. The rye was outgrowing the cows again. So we got another two weeks worth of grazing out of that. And then we got really dry. So we pulled the cows, 
pulled the fence, stuck the planter in there, planted beans. I don't remember exactly what the yield was, but we were in the low 60s on it, wow. is what we pulled off of it. How late did those beans go in? Uh, it would have been that latter part of the first week of June. So back to, not to circle back to what I was asking, but so when date-wise were you able to turn them out on the rye in the spring? Oh, I wish April, I had a specific date. Um, it, depend, it all depends on your spring and your heat. Um, I think it's been proven that rye grows at 37 degrees. Okay. I mean, this craziness that you'll see happen out there. I got, I got one other cow story that just popped into my head. But yeah, by all means. So uh, I'll try to finish by answering your question so that I cover it. Uh, the cows go out. Um, we are later calving people. These, these cows that you see out there are full-blood Wagyu's. And my simple explanation for a full-blood Wagyu calf is it's looking for a reason to die. <laughs> now, cro cross it with an Angus, and the hybrid vigor comes to life, and, and I challenge you to find one that has more vigor. But a full-blood, I know, I know why we crossbreed them, okay? So anyway, um, we, we calf. Um, we've moved our calving back to we start mid-April. So those cows went out there someplace in that first two weeks of April is when they went out on this. And right, so you went basically the first two weeks of April all the way to the first week of June. Essentially. Okay. Yes. And one more cow story? Or one more cow story. So we have a, we have a set of uh, first calf heifers and we have them down on a, another farm. They've grazed it to nothing. We catch a foot of snow. I bring them back to our home base, which is all seeded to rye, and the rye was, it was a really good year. It was probably six to eight inches tall. Not to totally interrupt you, but I'm going to, so I don't forget. So I mentioned that we're doing entirely cereal rye. For your grazing purposes, is that the, do you plant a mixture at all, or no. is it just, you just straight cereal rye? Straight cereal rye, and, and I'm going to tell you why you just struck another nerve. Perfect. So when I was a young man, and my grandpa and I were out walking beans, I would look at grandpa and ask him, I said, why in the world did God not make some kind of crop that we can use, like a weed? Hot, dry, cold, it doesn't matter, weeds grow. Cereal rye, we just didn't know we had it. Got it. That's my definition of cereal rye. It is, it is unbelievable to watch what it can do. Now I forgot where, oh yeah, so the heifers, so the heifers. So I turn these heifers out on 100 acres and we do TMR, totally mixed rations. So a feed truck goes out, feeds these first calf heifers, feed's not leaving the bunk. Start out lower on poundage, so they went 20 pounds went out for them. They should be eating 30, 35. I couldn't figure out what these heifers were eating and there's a foot of snow on the ground. So as I sat out there and watched them in the pickup one day, what I realized was going on is they were burrowing down in the snow that was insulating the cereal rye and it was still growing and that's what they preferred over the mixed ration we had in the bunk. So there's another benefit to rye that I, I didn't see. Do you know how late, you mentioned you go th went through with a bush hog to make sure that it doesn't seed out, right? Right. So do you know how late in the season you could cut it and have it still perform like that under a snow layer? I mean, no, how, you know, no idea. How no. late do you typically, is the last time that you mow it? So we, uh, I guess I'm not following you here. For, so, so when we're grazing it, I guess, let me, let me answer it this way. So when we're grazing it, because we're two different things here, we chop it and we graze it. Yep. So when we graze it, we'll go out and mow it um, as much as every two weeks, okay. should it need be, because we don't want it to head. Yep. A lot of things that people don't realize about cereal rye is, is once it throws its head, it's done. You don't have to kill it. It's dead. Okay. What you'll kill are the tillers. So, so when we go out and chop, we're after tonnage, not quality. Um, it'll be as tall as the hood on any tractor in a good year. Um, our average right now is 8.8 .8 ton to the acre is what we chop off of it. And that's, I think it's a rolling average of about eight years of accumulation. And there were some mistakes made in there that definitely... If you don't want tonnage per acre, don't fertilize it. Okay. And, and if you want your rye to go flat, and this is my experience, go above 50 pounds per acre of actual nitrogen. That's when I had trouble with it starting to lodge on us. Okay. So I stay under that. 
And with the cost of fertilizer doing what it's done, obviously you don't want to waste anything. And the, now I just lost my train of thought. Uh, you were talking we about you were talking about chopping versus grazing, and okay, I was so talking chopping. about how late can you basically keep it? How late can you keep it short before you have to stop if you want it to live through the winter? Uh, right now, I could take you to 100 acres. It absolutely doesn't look like there's any rye growing there, and it was up and it was grazed down to nothing. And I could send you a picture of it this spring. And it'll be up. We'll chop it. Okay. It's amazingly resilient. Let's see. I have a couple other questions, but they more pertain to row cropping into it. So I'm trying to I'm trying right to uh, trying to phrase it into a way that matters for livestock as well. So um, we have some of our acres, obviously, that we lease out to the neighbors and things like that for them to put their cattle on once we're done harvesting. So some corn acres that are adjacent to the neighbors that they use, they maintain the fences. We let them, you know, graze it. And they just pay pasture rent. So. One of those farms we put into cover crop this year. So the cereal where I went in before we picked the beans off of it, so it was pretty fairly well established before the beans came off the field uh, and their cattle are out there um, on it. Well, right now I think, and it's not a lot. I think it maybe it's 40 head or something um, on 160 acres that are down there. Um, what considerations is there, so obviously these aren't my cattle, but they're, you know, I'm pasture renting it to another guy. What considerations are there for the like efficacy of my rye and going into spring as far as when to take them off of it? And then I guess the other question is, is if you are, if you were to go rent pasture ground that was, you know, on something that had just been harvested, is there a different rate if you have a cover crop in there for them to be able to, you know, muddle through in the winter or do you just pay the same for what you would normally pay for something like that? I don't know. I've no. never been put in that position, but my first thing that pops into my head is uh, it would be uh, on a per head per day basis. Um, if, if you offered me the acres, as long as I could cover my costs on it, I would drill the rye. Gotcha. The, the, the other thing about the cereal rye that you're put in, um, row crop side, Number one, give it time to do its work. So you have to allow it to root down and, and develop a root mass. And number two, don't look for any super improvements in your soil or your yields for at least four years. Just That's be, what I've heard. Be, be patient, be patient. And there is a change that happens as it did on this farm that was up here on the screen. Um, I've combined uh, 83 bushel acre beans off of it. In fact, that's how I got a Mac Don draper head because the auger head wouldn't work. And I borrowed a draper head to go try it, and I was unbelievable. Number one, the draper head worked perfect. Number two, the yields were fantastic, and I'm thinking this is a win-win. Um, this year in our dry area, uh, we were terribly dry. Um, that farm won the yield contest again, and it's one of my lower CSR farms. That sort of does bring me into it. A, a question and something I've done a little bit of research on, but I can't really find anything like definitive. So obviously with our rolling ground, we have a lot of ground that, you know, the tops of the hills get dry and the bottoms of the hills are wet and it ends up being kind of a wash. Dry years we do well on part of the field, wet years we do well on the other part of the field. Have you seen anything with the fields that you cover crop, basically retaining moisture where there wasn't any, using moisture where there's too much, that kind of stuff? Have you, I mean, I'm having a hard time finding any quantifiable papers that actually talk about that, but in your experience. So, so the existing farm, I'll, I'll, I'll keep going back to that as far as trying to quantify things. That existing farm has areas of sand in it. It's just a natural formation of sand. Um, running across it with a combine, you just basically raise the head. Why, why waste the time? Um, headed to the Dallas County Fair to watch some granddaughters show some sheep. Pulled out of the driveway in the morning, the, the corn was already white that we were driving by, protecting itself. I mean, things were pretty quiet between I and my wife. I, I swung over and went up the gravel road, got nipped on a little bit because we were already pushed for time. I could see the sand spots out there from the road. Went to the fair, came back, had time, stopped the car. She knows me really well. She always brings a book. So I bailed over the fence and I took off walking out to those sand spots. 
and I could find them when I got out there, more so because I knew where they were. But, and of course it was evening now, so it had cooled off. So it, I could see the white definitive of the lack of moisture in the sand spots from the road, but when I walked out in there, I had a hard time finding them. And to this day, I don't raise up on those sand spots. There's beans there. Sure, because the cover crop has yeah. basically. I have to you contribute think. it. Right. I have right. to contribute it. That's the only thing that you did differently. So, so the so the other thing that the rye does that I've really noticed about it, chopping or allowed to grow. I mean, I I, I planted rye on that farm one day. I I was nervous. I got the boys to get the cows off of it. I took off out into there. And I got down to the other end of the farm where the cows didn't want to graze because they're lazy. They want to be by the water. And up around the water tank, I'm six to eight inches tall. I get out there and it's taller than the hood on the tractor. And I, I can hear my grandpa talking to me and saying, boy, this ain't gonna work. And that was the year we raised 83 bushel acre beans off of that farm. But as I watched that throughout the dry season, um, and we did get rainfall, but uh, and timely rains in August, I, that needs to be clarified. But the thing that I noticed was I actually had cover out there on that ground and them hot, dry winds, the ground was not exposed to it. And if you look at the, the stems on that, that mature rye, they essentially are full of water. And I'm, I'm no scientist again, but my general idea, that year we were living, as we did this last year, on the dews that we were getting, and I think they were actually wicking the dews and holding it. If you look at that cereal rye in a mature status, it looks like straws. And if you reach down and break one of the straws off at the bottom, there's water in it. So I guess we have our own irrigation system and I didn't even know it. Yeah, there you go. So, I, so back to you talking about putting the beans into the rye, you said once it heads out, it dies. So do you spray it at all when you put the soybeans in after or you just let it die on its own? So. We don't spray after we graze, we plant. The problems that we have on that as far as uh, the rye coming back is where the cows have it grazed down. So we'll spray those areas. Um, we you use spot round. spray? Sorry? You just spot spray those areas If we where can. You can see it? And, and essentially the way it's set up and the water tanks are set up, yes. It, it somewhat looks like a center pivot when you go out to spray. Sure. Is what it kind of looks like. Um, sometimes, and my son does all the spraying for us, sometimes he sprays the whole thing. It varies from year to year. Um, he'll, he'll load the gun with Roundup, is all we use. First, first time out, um, flip over to the chopping side. I'm planting the beans, the sprayer doesn't show up for two weeks. We see what comes back, and, and essentially it's the tillers have come back that is what he sprays. Sure. Sometimes we have to go the full gamut. But some of the time you basically can save on spray because it just, Sometimes you just we wait, have you could kind of do the wait and see. Fifth, we have, no field is the same. Um, I, have, I have a saying, we talked about this last night, if the guy running the drill leaves rabbit runs, that causes all kinds of trouble because we spread a lot of manure. And I can guarantee if you want to raise sunflowers, feed cattle, buy hay and spread manure. And I hate sunflowers with a passion. But in those areas that they don't get a nice tight uh, cover, a rabbit run is what I call them. I always joke with them. I said, that's where the rabbits always run, so don't give them a place to run. Um, we get a lot, we have a lot of trouble with those areas with broadleaf. Okay. Um, I don't particularly care for dicamba beans because of the carryover or the, uh, the drift problems. And, and we've switched to a lot of our, all of our cover crop acres now have enlist beans on it. Right, we do all enlist as well. Do you, what, uh, when you plant in June, what length of, are you planting like two, two beans? Or no, I plant fuller season. Really? Fuller and season later. And you can get them out of it up keep, there keep them, keep, keep them shorter um, is, is the concept and, and make them bush and find a bean that will bush for you. Sure, interesting. Let's see. Um, what else can I tell you? I guess since you've been doing it for 15 years, tell me what is the most surprising thing to you. Like from when you first started doing it, you're like, oh, we're gonna try this. What were you most um, unexpectant of 
in your like cover crop rotation, specific to livestock or not? The, the change in the soil is probably the most surprising thing that I've seen. And, but the thing you have to do is you have to be patient. And you also have to be patient when you kill it or you're not going to get that benefit in your soil. Um, there's just, it, the soil just kind of comes to life. I guess I don't know other way to say it. Um, I hear a lot of horror stories about I can't kill it. Sorry? And I don't, I don't agree with that. Have we had trouble killing it before? Absolutely. Go out and spray it on a cold day. Sure. You, you have to be patient. I guess that's, that's probably the biggest thing with cover crops is you have to have patience. And for heaven's sakes, don't worry about what the neighbor says. <laughs> Good grief. What about what your old man says? Do you have to care about what your dad says? Well, that is a problem. <laughs> That's a problem. So we had that conversation a little bit too, which isn't really the, the purpose of this, but I did think it was interesting when we were talking on the phone about how you were talking about the ability to like let other people manage the farms when feeling like you weren't doing your due diligence. Uh, oh, oh. We so so here, here, here's transitional stage. I don't know how many young people we have around here, but I'm transitioning my sons into the operation. And that's, that's one of the first things. Is that where you're headed? Yeah, I was Is just, that I mean, that's, we're sort of at the same, so, same spot as far as that, but we're on opposite sides of the transition, exactly, right? So. Exactly, exactly. I don't want to quit, but I think my body's going to make me. So eventually, and, and it is slowing down. It's amazing. At each decade, it's amazing what you lose. You gain it. And then all of a sudden you're over the hill and now you start losing it, is I think what happens. But anyway, um, the, the definition that we had when we first talked was being the father, being the old man on the other side. Um, I can relate to that feeling that you have when you're transitioning your farm over to the next generation. My last name starts with a Z, so it's back to high school. I'm in high school right now. And I got to have a book report. I hate to read. I'm a visual learner. And all I did was read, read the prelude and I do my book report off of that. I mean, that's, that was my, because I had, I had farming to do. What in the heck would I want to be in school for? And you walk into the class because you're Z, you're not going to have to give your book report until Friday. And she says, guess what? We're going to start at the last of the, M, the alphabet. That rot gut feeling that you have is the same feeling that you'll have as you're transitioning things over to your kids. And I explained this to my sons. You just have to be patient with us. So this topic of conversation came up when I was, you know, explaining to them that this is our first year doing cover crop, right? And uh, my dad is 62, and my uh, his, his yeah his uncle farms with us full time <laughs> as well. He's 70, and uh, he'll die on a tractor. It doesn't matter what we tell him. We could tell him to go to Tahiti, and he'd be like. No. Uh, so he'll be out there forever. And then my younger brother and my, my dad's brother, who's a little younger than him, are all out there farming uh, full time. And I help when I can, but obviously I have my real time job and then pretty much manage the books. And uh, so when we decided we were going to do cover cropping this year, um, the typical, I guess, maybe myths or maybe maybe some, you know, some truth to it of all the different reasons not to do cover crop were all the things that spilled out of my dad's mouth. Um, I mean, there was a reason we never did it before in his mind. And so as I started to dig more into this, and my, my brother and I are both fairly environmentally conscious people. I, you want to throw my slide back up, but we have been over the last couple of years championing some non- um, traditional ways of making power out at our at our operation. So this is our grain bins out there, and we we have two large solar arrays that we put up out there, basically to power the fans for the bins and some of that stuff. And and during the Q and A or afterwards, if anybody has any questions about that, we did do like a USDA grant for 25% of paying for that, and basically put it up ourselves. It's there's a whole lot of benefits to being able to do it, and there's still the solar tax credit for another year. And farm wise, you can depreciate it and take the tax credit. So there's a lot of a lot of good stuff with that. But anyway, so my brother and I are, are, are champions of sort of some of this more environmentally friendly stuff. And, and a lot of what you were saying is one of the things that we really thought was important for our land is making the soil better and then not having it be bare all winter mm -hmm. um, for what we're, what we're doing out there. Like there's just something seems unnatural about the ground just being out there naked, if you will, um, all winter long. And so all the reasons not to do it kind of started coming out of my dad's mouth. And convincing him to just let me run with it. And it helped a little bit that I knew the guy that was doing the flying. And I knew, you know, he knew the guy that sold the cover crop, went through Iowa cover crop here. And, um, and that helped a little bit to like get him on board. 
Um, and obviously the practical farmers of Iowa have the 40 acres worth of subsidies you can get if you sell your row crop to Cargill and ADM and those folks. And so all that, all that sort of added up where basically we cover cropped uh, a little over 200 acres and almost didn't pay for any of it. Um, and obviously that's not sustainable for three or four years because you're, you're gonna have to start, you know, the subsidies don't last that long. But that was a good way to like get him over the hump of like, hey, what's, what's the worst that can happen here as far as trying to push him into something that was new where at least I could say, well, it doesn't really cost you that much money. Let's just try it. You know what I mean? Yeah, we farmers tend to look at bottom lines pretty close. That's just how, how we're wired, I guess. But um, yeah, I wish the subsidy side of it would get us over the hump over that fourth year um, for people to see that. Um, and I mean, I hope everything works out fantastic. Um, what, one other experience, you just made this pop into my head, is I'm, I'm still struggling on my soybean ground going to corn because cereal rye is a grass, corn is a grass. I have never been very successful at that. Um, and had some years that worked out really good and boy we hit this right on the money and we added extra nitrogen and, and we did everything and, and I'm, I'm hearing 20 bushel yield backs and I, I had a 40 bushel yield back or draw on it. Yeah, and we'll really have that challenge this year with what we had in that went into, in that was flown into beans that will be corn next year. So. And especially with the way that nitrogen prices are going next year, I'm not going right. to feel like much of a hero on those acres unless we can figure out a way to like kind of get around it. Um, so we'll see how it we'll see how it works out. We're obviously experimenting with some dry fertilizer stuff. We may actually put some anhydrous on this fall just to save some costs, and then maybe go back during the spring. I don't know. It just it just depends on how prices fall and and our standard like manpower issue on those acres. Um, I yep. am looking forward to what we flew onto the corn to see how the, the beans do in it because more by and large, people when they're excited about it, they talk about like what you talk about where cereal rye was in there, they planted in soybeans and had great yield and it's just like, for some reason it seems like something that shouldn't be the way that it works, but it is. And so um, I'm, I'm mostly just looking forward to see how it all shakes out. Two, two things popped into my head. One's a positive, one's a negative, but it turned positive, the negative did. So we, we've been 100% now, this is our second year, 100% cover crop. Um, this spring when I was planting corn, um, I have uh, Precision's um, row cleaners on the front of my planter. It's the only set of row plant cleaners I've ever left on my planter because I can adjust them from the cab. And the size of planter that we run anymore, we can't keep our contours like we used to. It's just impossible. So you have to be very careful so that you don't get erosion because if you're going up and down a hill, that's, that's where the corn tends to wash out if you get that rain you don't want. But the thing that really alarmed me, and this was flown on with an airplane ground, the particular farm that I was on, I mean, we were so, so dry, and I was in excess of uh, two and three quarters of an inch in depth. And I got out and, and decided I was gonna have to go deeper because we, it was hot and dry. I mean, there just went any other way around it. And when I got to digging in, half of the planter was in really good rye and half of the planter was not. The rye had been terminated, but I had all kinds of moisture where I had the rye and where I had just the bare bean stubble, even though covered with the material from last year's beans, I, I, I had to put the planter in. I, I went to three and a quarter is what I went to to find moisture. And that, that part amazed me. So I don't know how you put a value on that. Right. But I could tell you if we'd got a four inch rain, there'd have been a ton of value on it, I felt, because emergence would have been a problem. Right. And, and then the other side of it is, here's, here's a negative. So the, the same farm here, I keep beating this farm to death up here that those cows are grazing on. We needed to lime because we use a lot of manure. It takes a lot of lime to keep our pHs balanced. I limed it. Um, there was a fellow that was working for me that was actually dying of cancer and he needed something to do just to clear his head. So I sent him out with a field cultivator to field cultivate the lime in because lime doesn't move in the soil. I forgot to call the NRCS office and tell them what I was doing. So I was gifted with a $10,000 fine for field cultivating 150 acres of lime and I tried to explain it. I, 
Yeah, I don't want to get negative. It, I, I couldn't get myself away from it, so you just pay the fine and walk on. The very next year after the cover crops had, had grown out there, um, I, I brought the, the, the local director out, and he had a young gal with him, an intern, and we got in my pickup, and I was combining beans out on it, and I said, I just want to show you something. And there is some e-slopes on that farm. And I drove him all the way around the farm, you know, and we, we were talking about all of it and the benefits and so forth. And I looked over at him when we stopped and I says, do you realize what we just did? And he's like, no, I have no idea. So we just drove 150 acres and I never once touched my brake to go through a finger ditch or a rill anywhere. I said, that's the real benefit. And the crazy thing was, so here I'll, I'll make it, I'll try to make this story funny. He calls me. Um, that fall, and they, they've got a simulator, which is very interesting. If you ever get a chance to watch this, it simulates a rain. And essentially what this thing was is it had a, uh, a spray nozzle that goes above it, and they can set how many inches of rainfall, and they set buckets up underneath it in, in various spots as to how either the runoff water or the infiltration water. Okay, well, I didn't get to that meeting. Uh, I was busy. And I had a few comments from people who said, hey, you won. And they said, won what? Well, what they did is they come out and they cut a block of that dirt out. And then it was no-tilled, cover crop, conventional tilled, were there different scenarios. There was four different scenarios. And, and by the way, I told him, I said, yes, you can come out and get that little plot of dirt, but it costs 10,000 bucks. So, so anyway, a year later, I got to see that same simulation because he called me again. He wanted to come and get a piece of dirt. We were having a meeting in Atlantic, front where I'm from, and um, the local producer said the same thing. Totally amazing to watch what that cover crop did as far as infiltration of the water. Sure. You darn near drink it. Right. It was that clean. So um, how do you measure that? Right. And, and unless you can get your father or the older generation that's not willing to accept some of these new practices, I, I, don't, know how, I don't know how else to help. But if that, that was so impressive to me. And I've seen it in real life. I just didn't realize what I was watching. Sure. I didn't realize how much infiltration we had. Okay. Well, one other story. You get me on all these stories here. So we're going to chop. Um, this is very first, maybe one year into it. We have a river bottom farm. Uh, it has a tendency to be a little unruly and be wet. And it's Sunday, we're headed to church, and I see my son hooking up the wind drawer, and back then we were using a, self or a, a swing tongue wind drawer, and it was time to get it chopped and get the beans planted because we didn't know anything about anything of what we were doing. And he went down there, and I said, what are you doing? He says, I'm headed down there to wind that. And I said, well, I'll come pull you out after church. <laughs> so you're going to be stuck. <laughs> And about 4 o'clock in the afternoon, Sunday afternoons is when I go check a lot of cows in the different pastures. I think about him. I think, oh, my gosh. Because it's two and a half miles back into this bottom where he's at. And I get down there, and he's got 100 acres plus cut. And I said, well, that's fantastic. I said, but how are we going to chop this? We can't get in there with the trucks. We started out with tractors and spreaders that we use that they'll haul 20 ton. But it's a four-mile haul. We couldn't keep up with the chopper, so we started sending tandem trucks down. And eventually I saw the semi pull out of the driveway, and I thought, oh, Lord, we never did hook on to them. So there is a root mass underneath there, I guess is where I'm trying to get to this, that is unbelievable. Right, that was holding, up, that holding, was holding them together, up. Right, despite the moisture. And a lot of those wet areas, because this is back to your original question, a lot of those wet areas that we had, now we've, we have tile, and, and we have problem areas. I, I would never say that we don't. But a lot of those areas have really shrank or completely disappeared. So it has to be the activity that's going on underneath that's right. opening up those the hard pan. Right. Um, that bottom typically always got deep tilled or chiseled, and very seldom are we ever down there anymore, other than to take out the hull paths. And, and we do have a green cart with tracks on helps. to try to help. But the combine is probably the next culprit. Right. Right. And even though it's dueled up and what have you, it still causes problems. Yeah. Yeah. But truly, the repetitive back and forth, if we just do a surface tillage with a disc chisel, and Lord, all Friday, when you drop it in the ground, you'll know if you're in the right spot or not. Yeah. But we don't, I don't see those 
long lasting paths that we used to see. Sure. So I have to attribute it to right. um, organic matter and root mass. Right. So. Well, do you have anything else for me? I think I'm pretty well spent on questions and I'd rather let these guys, if they have questions for us, start you know, asking them just so that we're you want me to quit telling stories? No, I think your stories are great. <laughs> I just okay. want to make sure that if these folks have stuff they want to ask about, they can sure. get the information right? from you that, that you have available. Okay, if folks have questions for Shannon and Shannon, Alan, and then we'll go to cattle, cover crops, transition. Brendan's going to start. Um, Alan, I'm curious, have you seen a different with your herd health management calving into cover crops versus By far. just calving on a lot? It's like fresh ground. Yeah, like, like, like what you, if you're a cow-calf man, if you can move that around, um, it sure mitigates the bugs. Have you played with uh, wait until spring and putting oats out? to kind of stretch that grazing period a little bit longer and then possibly doing like a, a warm season mix to do full season grazing as part of the rotation? My son would love to, but I always want to plant beans. <laughs> no, I have not. I have not. Testing. Any scholar problems with the calves when they're on the cows when that rise wash you? No, not. We vaccinate for it um, on those wagus, but I would answer no. No, not any, not anything that we hadn't seen already on pastures. Actually, it's less because we're taking them to new ground. We'll start them out, start those cows out on paddocks that typically have, we do all of our calving on. Well, here's another added bonus that I didn't say. So we'll, on that 300 acre farm, we're way overpopulated. We feed everything that the cow needs for the day, but obviously they're gonna go eat the grass off. When we take, the one thing that I didn't contribute is when we take those cows out and put them out on that rye, those sacrifice pastures where we do all that calving, all of a sudden grow up um, and they're usable again instead of being ruined for the entire year. Because that 60 days or 45 days or whatever we get out of that grazing season allows that grass to take off back in the pastures. Uh, I have a question, one for each of you. First, Shannon. Um, could you enumerate the objections that your father had to cover crops? And the second question, um, have you ever had an opportunity to plant uh, winter cereal rye in the spring? Um, because it normally doesn't produce a head then that year. Sure, so the things that uh, primarily my father had objections to were uh, definitely concerns about nitrogen for the corn crop going on um, the following year. And basically, I sort of got around that by saying like, look, I think that if we are going to do it for three or four years, because that's really what it takes to, to see any benefit, which I'm aware of from doing research before we started down this train, then it doesn't do us any good to just, just do the acres that are in corn right now because next year they're gonna be in beans. So um, I sort of kind of was of the mentality like if we're gonna do it, let's do it in both our two um, crop types and see and see what we're working with, right? Like learn, learn. we're gonna have to learn either this year or next year so might as well do it now um, was sort of my counter argument to that. And then the other like biggest, well, yeah, the other biggest thing was the money piece of it. So. Um, and, and a little bit labor, which we got around by doing the, the aerial seeding. Um, but by the time everything was said and done, we had 160 acres that we had um, subsidies from NCRS for um, being first time cover croppers, which was I think $25 an acre towards it. And then we did a PFI um, subsidy for 40 acres, which is $40 an acre. Uh, I got the bill a couple of weeks ago. The, Basically, it was thirty dollars an acre to put on the sixty pounds of cereal rye and fly it on. So, you break all that out. Essentially, it was it was almost break even. So it didn't really cost us that much money uh, this year. Next year, we'll go down from where we were on the NCRS as first time to like you know second year, and there's still some available, but it's not as lucrative by any means. Uh, and so I'll have to probably rehab that fight. But hopefully, as we get into it, I'm I'm mostly hoping that 
This year, as we get into spring, we'll see some advantages on our rolling ground, even right away with the moisture. So I'm hoping, and I'm hoping if we can see that and we can get into the field at the same time with slightly less instances of getting stuck and things like that where we have this cover crop laying down that that will be enough to convince him you know to do it the next year and the following year so um those were those were the two biggest concerns that he had um other than just like a general fear of the unknown probably okay and so the only experience i've had of putting cereal rye down in the spring is i had some heavy traffic areas on some fields that i had grazed over the winter it, it basically had gotten muddy so I went back down and I drilled those areas back in so that we could harvest the rye. Um, the rye stayed stool and stooled and short, never did amount to anything as far as any tonnage because I was after chopping, not, not grazing. And it, it was miserable to try to get it killed on the spring planted. I do remember that. But that's the only time I've ever put it on in the spring. So you guys have talked about what the advantages of the cover crop is to the cattle. My question is, what do you think the advantage, you know, what do the cows contribute to the, to the ground? And then secondly, you asked about, you were talking about the rent uh, that the cow man's paying you. <clears throat> My question is, what are you paying the cow man? Nothing. And a contribution that the cows do is I don't have to scoop up the manure and haul it. Because in, in, in our sacrifice pastures that we have, um, we have to go in and clean those pens. And I, I don't consider manure a chore. I consider manure an asset. Um, so the cows spread it out versus having it all concentrated in one area if I bring them a TMR. Um, the contribution of the manure to the ground uh, over and above the P and K and the nitrogen, um, I can't explain that part. But I can see and I can tell on the farms where we spread manure. We use both open dry lots and we've started building uh, deep bedded barns. And the manure that comes out of the, the deep bedded barns, I can take a 50 CSR farm and make it yield right with my 80 CSR farms. And it's amazing how much nitrogen we get out of there. And I learned this at the last boot camp that we went to, and I'd never considered this. We try not to spread any manure until the ground gets below 50 degrees, so we save that nitrogen, which I had never given that any thought. But uh, three years ago in our area, we had a terrible time uh, retaining the nitrogen. And you could drive by field after field of my neighbor's crops, and, and they're good farmers there. It's not any, that they did anything wrong. We just had a, a major amount of nitrogen that was lost. And the majority of the fields where we had spread manure on stayed as just as glossy green as could be to the point that I was actually the talk at the coffee shop is, why are you still green and we're not? And the only thing I could contribute it to is A, cover crop, B, the manure that we put on. Because if the ground that we chop, we make sure that we spread manure right back on that. So we're, we're giving the organic matter back. We soil test everything and we, we do it in grid sampling too. Right. So, so we know without a doubt what we're trying to do. Now, sure. maintaining what comes out of the back of the manure spreader, I'll leave that up to somebody else because they want to know how many tons per acre you put on, and we shoot for 11. That's as close as we can get it. Yeah, as far as the ground that we pasture rent out, um, it's all neighbors and all that, so it's a pretty fair rate that we give to them. But I certainly don't discount the having their cattle on our ground and having their manure yep. you know, naturally on the ground uh, by all means. They don't um, typically feed in our lots, so it ends up spreading out pretty naturally through its own um, being there. But I also do... we. We no-till everything, um, so sometimes, which is why we don't encourage them to feed in the field because compaction can be an issue for us. So um, obviously, with them being out there, we recognize there's a benefit to our field, um, certainly by having them out there. But for us, it's a small income stream, and we have the land available. We're not using it, so uh, if the guys want to pasture rent it, then, then that's what we have them do. But the rye should also help you as far as the compaction. Hopefully, yeah. Because it is amazing when we take the cows off this pasture how 
very little compaction problems there are other than the trails that they want to make. If we could get them all to scatter out and walk four foot apart, I'd be taking COVID times? Right, right, right. Yeah, there you go. There you go. That'll, that'll do it. Just, did you have a question? So what about spring grazing and compaction? I was scared to death of it when I started. I don't have any problems. The one thing that I did do this year is our chop trails when we're hauling out with trucks. Um, I purchased, a, I went back to a uh, um, disc chisel with straight shanks and I don't have to bury it, but I go in and I break up those paths. I tried that this year and a very dry year. I figured all I'd have was just dry strips, but the beans actually responded really well to that and came right up. So as far as the compaction problems, um, in the chopped fields, it's the drive paths where people repetitively drive with the trucks when they're hauling out. In the cow pasture scenario, it's where the girls want to walk in a straight line, but eventually what the beans will do is they'll canopy out over it. If, if, if the watering system that we have out in the middle, I'll actually go in and till that area up before we plant beans. I'll go out ahead of the, the planter. Um, we have, in our operation, have focused on the corn side as far as precision, not the bean side. And that's kind of woke me up that we need to pay a little more attention to there. So we're going to make some changes on our bean planter as to how we're doing things. I'm going to change colors. I found a color that works a lot better if there is a compaction problem and does a lot nicer job when it, when it lays, it, it closes a trench behind it. Um, and then you pray for rain. Because rain, rain will cover up, I, here I am being the philosopher again, but rain will cover up a lot of sins that happen out in the fields. Hey, Alan, a couple years ago we talked about doing 60-inch wide corn down at your farm. Yes. And um, I just wondered if you ever pursued that. I didn't. Um, I did. I got, I got shunned by my sons, not the dad. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, I think it's something that with the cattle guys, it's working out real well. It uh, needs to be looked um, into. The, okay. Uh, you know, southern Iowa, you could maybe get by with 40-inch 40, 40 corn. Northern Iowa, definitely 60-inch wide corn up there is, uh, or vice versa, I guess, yeah. actually. Yeah. Southern Iowa, 60-inch and 40-inch up north. But anyway... You mentioned uneven spread with the airplane. You could tell which direction the plane was going on your terraces. Um, have you ever considered the Hagee with the drops to get it down in between the rows to where you get a little more or a lot better uh, distribution of the seed? So here comes the old guy out. Um, the majority of our ground is all contoured. Uh, tons and tons of point rows. Um, we do a one pass on herbicide on our corn and it's because I'm so particular about him not driving over corn. There's nothing makes me sicker than be running a combine down and all of a sudden two rows disappear and I glance over at the yield monitor and, and you can pick it out. So that, that's my response. I'd love to be able to do that. If I could drive straight north and south or east and west, I'm all in. All right. I understand now, I forgot. And, and I have some guys, some neighbors that are all running 20 inch rows. I had some neighbors that switched to 20 inch rows on all their crops. It makes total sense because you can use the same machine to plant corn or beans. We'll run two machines at the same time, so that kind of takes that out of our scenario. But I watch them and, and I can't answer from the conservation side how this makes sense or doesn't. But it, it seems like the new generation farmer that I'm watching in our area wants to strike an AB line and they plant north or south or east or west. I'm still an old contour guy. I want a contour, but I watch the 20 inch row guys spray their corn and they'll spray at a 45 degree angle. The only problem with the majority of our farms is I've built terraces and I, I know what's gonna happen when I try to send my son down a 20 inch row with a sprayer. I have a question for you. Um, I had to step out for a minute, so sorry if you already covered this, but from a weed management perspective, looking at it over oh. time, are you seeing benefits from either the cover crops and or the grazing? I, I have 
one particular farm that that the uh, Roundup resistant water hemp was determined. I, I called the county agent and said, something's going on here because it's not working. It's gone. I only have one thing to contribute it to. Uh, I, here, here's another thing that's cereal rye. Here's a negative to cereal rye. If you don't want your headlands or waterways killed, do not drill through them. I, I've seen it take out 10 year old established brome grass headlands and you come back the next year and it's like, what happened? And you swear it's the guy running the sprayer. But, but I've watched him for the last nine years spray, so I know how, what kind of operator he is, and he doesn't kill him. So it had to be the cereal rye. It, it is an absolute weed choking machine. But you gotta get the stand, and the other thing you have to do, okay, so you brought up another story. So I have a young guy that I'm preaching cover crops to, and he farms a good distance away from us. Um, and he calls me one day, and I've known him, my wife used to babysit him, so I've known him forever. And he calls me one day, he says, hey, I tried this cover crop thing you're talking about. And he took a, an aerator, a pasture aerator, and put a Gandy cedar on top of it. Unbelievable job that it did. I, I was totally impressed with what he had built, and very little money spent. Uh, he had a father-in-law that gave him the aerator, if I'm right, so all he had to do was invest in the Gandy. And he calls me, and it was a wet spring, and, and we were struggling to get our crops in. And he said, man, I got, I got big trouble. Um, what's that? And he said, well, I took your advice, and I planted 400 acres. I said, well, that's getting in with both feet. So you got that figured out. I said, so what's the problem? He says, well, I can't get my beans in. And I said, where are you at? Well, he's down in southern Iowa. He's uh, two, two tiers up from the Missouri line. I said, okay. Well, it's wet. Yes. This is the exact conversation, or as close as I can do it verbatim. And I said, do your neighbors have their beans planted? Well, no. Well, how do their fields look? They're a mess. He said, they're just covered with weeds. And yours? Well, it's really a fantastic crop. I said, all right, so let's get in the pickup. So I got in the pickup with him, and we drive down there. I said, I'll buy all of it. Let's bale it. Well, how are we going to get this off? I said, a lot of butts, but we'll get this done. So we went down and attacked it with three balers and three windrowers and hauled it all off. And I believe he said his beans were 58 bushels to the acre, and the other neighbors that he was talking to around there were in the 40s or in the 50s. And I said, and did you ask them how their herbicide bill was in compared to yours? Well, no, he said, I really don't want to offend them, but I said, what did you do? And he said, I did just what you said. I did one round of Roundup to kill off the tillers, and they had to come back in for some broadleaf because they didn't get the canopy like they wanted. So it, it, it really is, a, we, we consider our cereal rye our pre on those acres that we chop and harvest. So. When you turn your cows loose in the spring, is there any worry about them getting too much green? No, there was when we first did it, absolutely. Can you repeat what he said? Oh, oh yeah, his, his question was, so we bring the cows and we turn them out into this grass or this cereal rye for the first graze. Are we worried about them? I mean, we, we do the high mag thing. Uh, I'm, I'm a, we do that, but I have never had any trouble with the rye. Um, stand back when they cough, I can tell you that. <laughs> but, but otherwise, no, no, we have not had any trouble. And, and the mature it gets, the more that you'll see them wanting to eat the tillers, which is the opposite thing you want them to do. You want them to eat the ones that are getting ready to head. But the, I, we, we had a huddle meeting on it, but nobody listened, so we just went out and mowed it. So they, no, no, no trouble at all with that. My next question is um, for Shannon. So I know that from the call we had, you're hoping to integrate livestock again in the future. So as you become more comfortable with cover cropping, what's your long-term vision for that? Do you just want to graze straight rye, experiment with mixes, chop and do rileage? What are you thinking? Um, I think probably, so what, we, what we've done in the past is um, much like your stuff, our row crops, our row crop ground, and then we have pasture ground uh, as well. Right now, um, most of that pasture ground is more or less being neglected 
uh, due to our lack of manpower as far as like putting up hay and all this other stuff. So um, I think probably the next step for us as far as, well, obviously we're gonna keep implementing the cover crop in the ground that we have it in at least for the next three years to like see how it goes. So we're talking about only really 10% of our ground. Um, if I can see something significant from it in the next couple of years, I'll be able to do cover crop on more ground as far as like convincing the conglomerate that is my family that it's a good idea to do it. Um, but as far as speaking to the pasture ground for our livestock, I think probably the next step for us is actually doing some research and figuring out where the line is between what we have in hay ground that we can graze and, and what we would want to put into something like cereal rye. I also might be able to get them on board to, to make some of those acres grazing acres and then put them into beans, like, like what you're talking about. I think that's probably like a pretty good happy medium as far as not taking away a bunch of acres from, from row cropping uh, and still being able to like integrate the livestock into that, into that piece of it with the acres that we have. So I felt like I hadn't done my homework because I didn't bring anything to put up on the screen as far as numbers. So the numbers I can give you are what are fresh in my head. Um, and I haven't put the 2021 20, crop in yet. This, it's been too nice outside. We got way too much work to do. Um, this year, I don't have an explanation as to why, but typically our rolling average is 8.8 .8 ton to the acre is what we chop. That's what we get in production. If I want to cut it in half, don't put any nitrogen on. And, and the reason we figured that out is we forgot one farm. So um, it didn't get covered, but that, that, that was blatantly obvious that we don't want to do that again. The harvest this year was 15.3 uh, 15 tons to the acre. And we don't know why. The drill was running a week earlier because I had a really aggressive retired guy that wanted to run it. And, um, but I can also say that our, our carn yields and our bean yields were through the roof. And I, I got caught in that deal because I, I did the old saying that my uncle used to say to me, we're picking corn today, boy. And it took me a couple years to figure out what that meant, but it was so dry that we were taking the top end off the yield is what he was referring to. So why we had the yields that we have, um, I've heard everything from the smoke to, it's because I sold you good beans. So I, I don't understand that, but our rolling average our, our soybean acres on, we call them rye beans is what we call them. We're $138 an acre better off on those acres versus our just straight bean acres. So that, that, that's our rolling average. So, um, and, and again, I haven't, I haven't factored in this year, but, but we were about a bushel and three quarters better off yield-wise on our rye beans versus our conventional early planted beans. And that's totally contrary to what the industry's telling us. So I, I don't have an answer, but that's, that's the facts because it's, it's all, everything we have goes through the precision yield monitor and also is run across the scale and weighed to verify. So. Could either of you speak to using sorghum Sudan grass for feeding or grazing? I can't. I, I don't have a lot of experience at all. I, I, I was all ready to do it. And then I chickened out and planted it to corn. Yeah, I, anything I'd be able to tell you is just a repeat of the stuff I've seen put out by PFI, so. I don't really like to eat it. What was that? I don't really like to eat it. Right, right. Right, and, and, and my, the only thing that I can clarify is, is years ago we had a bunch of bottom ground that my uncle was farming that was wet and we planted it and we ended up with shatter cane out of the deal. And they tell me they've taken that out of there, but we fought that for years before we got ahead of that deal. So, but I, I was, I was gonna put 150 acres of it in and I chickened out after that, that bad feeling of experience so I just put it to corn and told the boys we'd chop and we ended up combining it and it went in behind rye is what we did. We have time for one more question if anyone wants to ask one. More. Uh, can you 
summarize uh, your methods for, you know, saw that field out there. There we go. Uh, can you summarize your methods um, as far as planning dates um, and what rotations you used uh, for that nice stand of uh, cereal rye you had out there? When you, in your rye beans is what you call it? For, for the one with the pasture and the cows? Yeah. Okay, so typically the beans are harvested um, mid-October. Uh, the drill plants, uh, I plant. We aim for 100 pounds to the acre, but typically we seem to always land in that 92 to 96 pounds per acre of cereal drilled. Um, those cows go out um, second, for, first to second week of April. I, I'm, is about as close. There's not a real specific date. We just watch the rye, and once I feel comfortable that they're not going to tramp it, to nothing, and I'm not sure that they could. Um, the cows come off typically the last of May, first of June, because at that same time in our operation, hopefully we're done planting corn, and I'm we're chopping, and I'm I'm planting beans right behind it. So subject to that timeliness for me to be able to get back and plant that field. This year, um, I lost all my help on a Saturday afternoon. It had something to do with the wedding. So I went out and I planted the beans while the cows were still out there. I just, I got an 83 year old that's helped me for years and he got me over there with a the seed tender and I planted it. And, and those beans were our best beans this year. So really it's, it's really um, contrary to what we're hearing about planting beans early. And I think one, just a bean rye. Yes, yeah, sorry, yep. No, it hasn't been corn. I'd love to go plant it to corn, but my youngest son wants cows on it, and if I throw cows in the mix, it's not going to work. And um, so we've stayed in this rotation. Um, I, I can tell you, but we've been dry, so i got to be a little careful with this statement. The farm is set up to have terraces put on it, and I really don't want to do it if we're going to keep it in this program. Because cows and terraces causes a lot of problems. They want to walk up and over and not go around them. And the other thing is, is contour goes out the window on this farm. It's get it in as fast as we can. So I hit the AB line and plant it east or north and south. But as of yet, have had no reason to change that. And I have to contribute that. If you went out into that field today, which is now planted to rye and it's starting to turn green, uh, the root mass and the root balls that are underneath there are all there and very visible, just like a no-till field when you go in to plant corn into a cornfield, soybeans into a cornfield. It's all there. 